Today, we're going on a journey back in time to look at some of the most challenging grinds in the history of Destiny. From the agony of fighting RNG to get the very first raid armor drops in early Destiny 1, to god tier weapons being gated behind grueling PvP competitive rank systems, to deep mysteries requiring the entire community to come together to solve massive puzzles. These are the challenges that have tested the resolve of even the bravest of Guardians since day one of this franchise. In the beginning, there was Forever 29, a phrase that struck fear in the hearts of Destiny players during the game's earlier days. During year one of Destiny 1, reaching the maximum light level of 30 was the ultimate goal for dedicated players. However, the path to achieving this milestone was full of frustration and disappointment as reaching that goal was completely based on RNG drops from Destiny's first raid, The Vault of Glass. In order to grow your character's light level, which was the old name for power level, you'd have to get armor and weapons to drop from the raid. You'd get level 28 items from the normal version of the raid. But in order to get any higher level, you'd need to complete encounters in the hard mode version of the raid. And this was brutally difficult for the average Destiny player. The community was so undeveloped compared to today that people had no idea how to beat these difficult encounters, especially if they were underleveled by not having any of this level 30 raid gear yet. You could only get a drop once per character per week, but if you made multiple versions of the same character, you could transfer items over to the new character and then play the raid again for more chances for a drop. Week after week, players were disappointed by the brutally stingy RNG, and LFG groups typically only wanted players who were level 30 already because it made the raid substantially easier to complete. Thus, the Forever 29 meme was created. The pain of being stuck at 29 was so severe that it was common for players to delete a fully leveled up character and then re-level a fresh character within the same week just to get an extra chance at that last piece of armor to drop and escape the Forever 29 club. Some of these grinds can be tiring and maybe even demoralizing if you're spending long hours battling RNG with no success. It's important to take good care of yourself if you're spending a lot of hours battling the digital world, and nutrition is a key part of that. If you want to eat some restaurant quality food that's delivered fresh to your door, you might want to give Factor a try. Their meals are a much better deal than spending a fortune on takeout services, and you can heat up each meal in just 2 minutes so you can min-max your time gaming and spend much less time cooking or cleaning. They have a ton of variety to choose from with over 35 weekly options covering basically any dietary requirement that you might have, and they also have a ton of cool add-ons like snacks, beverages, and even breakfast. I really like how the meals help you spend time on things that you want to focus on while still getting some good nutrition. Plus, I like to track all of my meals in a fitness app, and they have all the calories and macros labeled on each meal so it's super easy to do. Head over to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code PATTYCAKES50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off of your month of orders. That's code PATTYCAKES50 at Factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off of your next month of orders. By the way, Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider variety of meals to choose from, there's something for everyone. I love switching between the brands, and now you can enjoy both brands at a discount. In early Destiny 1, the only way to earn certain exotic weapons was to be blessed with an exotic bounty that would pop up when you got lucky turning in your normal bounty completions. Perhaps the most coveted of these early exotic bounties was called A Light in the Dark, the exotic bounty for the hand cannon Thorn. If you're playing Destiny today, you're probably familiar with Thorn, but back in Destiny 1, it was one of the most coveted weapons by players and was exceptionally rare when the game first launched. While it was initially perhaps a bit underpowered, it soon got a major buff that propelled it to be one of the strongest weapons in the Crucible. The two-tap ability with headshots and the poison bullets made it dominate PvP, especially later on during Trials of Osiris. But the problem was getting the gun in the first place. Since it initially only dropped from the exotic bounty, you had to get exceptionally lucky to even start grinding up the Mountain of Pain that was required to unlock this weapon. Easily the quest step that provided the most frustration for many players was the PvP section. You had to get kills with Void Energy in the Crucible, but deaths would work against your progress. Back in these early days, Void weapons could be pretty hard to come by since your only Void primary options were locked behind the raids of the Vault of Glass and then later Crota's End. So you were effectively limited to special and heavy weapons which had naturally limited ammo. Then for Hunters, the bounty was even more difficult because you didn't have a Void subclass yet. So if you happened to get your Thorn bounty to drop on your Hunter like I did, you had an even tougher challenge ahead of you. And once you finally completed the PvP portion, you had a challenging strike ahead of you with a special mini boss that you had to kill in the middle of a normal boss fight. Of course, completing this quest gave you access to one of the coolest weapons in Destiny, but battling RNG for the bounty to drop in the first place, only to be followed by these challenging quest requirements, was grueling for many players. Continuing with our theme of RNG being annoying, 
we have another weapon that was locked behind random chance during the raid for the Dark Below expansion. The exotic from Crota's End was the auto rifle Necrochasm, but it didn't drop directly from the boss. You needed to first find a white weapon called Husk of the Pit and then upgrade it to the legendary version called Edel on Ali through a lengthy quest. Then finally, you had the ability to upgrade this weapon to its exotic form, Necrochasm. Unfortunately, in order to do so, the lengthy quest featured a final step requiring an extremely rare material called a Crux of Crota, which, you guessed it, could only be acquired as a random drop from killing the final boss of the raid, Crota, on hard mode. So you needed to not only beat the raid on hard mode, which was challenging enough for many players, but then also get lucky enough to get the Crux material to drop from the boss. If you were a completionist who wanted all of the exotics in Destiny, you better hope that RNG was on your side. Introduced as a new heavy weapon type in Destiny 1, swords were all the rage in the Taken King expansion. Which sword you would choose to go after is sort of what defined you as a guardian, kind of like choosing your first starter in Pokemon. After getting your legendary sword by beating the post-campaign quest, you needed to first upgrade it completely and then raise the light level up to 280 and that's just the beginning of this. Once completed, Lord Shax gives you an exotic quest, with the first step being killing 50 major enemies in PvE and 25 guardians in the Crucible. Not too bad, right? Well, it got steadily harder from there. The next step was to have a sword fight with the Sword of Oryx, but you needed to find and finish his three minions first within five seconds of each other. If you failed to meet this timer requirement, the door in front of you would not open and you'd have to try again. If you succeeded, you were able to try your fate to 1v1 him with the sword. And when you came out of this epic sword duel victorious, the fun really began. Lord Shax decided that you needed a massive amount of busy work, so he asked you to collect some resource nodes depending on which exotic you were wanting. So you had to spend the next several hours running loops through the moon for helium filaments, the cosmodrome for spin metal, or Mars for relic iron. But just collecting the base versions of these materials was not good enough for Shax. Every once in a while, you'd have a random chance to also collect the special versions of these materials which were actually required for the quest completion. No chests were allowed by the way, these special materials actually had to come from just harvesting the planetary materials directly. Oh yeah, and he also threw in some several hundred ability kills just for good measure. So you finally arrived at the very last step, but possibly the hardest. Now you needed to talk to Shax on Arms Day to unlock a special version of the Sunless Cell Strike. In it, you would need to slay a specific tanky hive major and the strike's boss Darkblade within 30 seconds of each other. And by the way, if you messed up on the timing, you got the joy of doing the whole strike over again. At the end of this journey, you finally got the exotic swords Boltcaster, Raze Lighter, or the best one, obviously, Dark Drinker. One of the most coveted PvP weapons in Destiny 1's lifespan was a pulse rifle that dropped exclusively from the Will of Crow to Strike where you'd fight the boss Omnigal. If you got lucky, she would drop the Grasp of Malak when she died. But as a community, we figured out that you didn't actually need to complete the strike to get the weapon to drop. If you could just deal enough damage to kill the boss as she retreated up that giant hill before the boss room, you could actually get drops from the kill. Of course, most of the time her death would not give you the grasp of Malak, and instead you would just be rewarded with two blues, which created one of the most historic Destiny community memes. Players would spend hours and hours racking up kills hunting for the perfect PvP roll of this pulse rifle, and flooding their inventory with blue weapons in the process. Let's move on to Destiny 2, specifically in the Warmind expansion during Year 1. On July 31st, 2018, we received an update that included a free event for all players, Solstice of Heroes. This featured plenty of activities and quests for everyone. The main reward from this quest was some new armor, three shiny glowy sets that players could earn by completing the quest for this event. However, earning this new armor was easier said than done. To fully upgrade the armor to legendary quality, players had to complete an enormous set of tasks for each piece of armor, upgrading them from white to green to blue and eventually purple. These tasks included generating elemental orbs, getting kills in the crucible, and killing bosses and mini bosses. It might not sound too bad on the surface, but you realize the number of these tasks required were a bit ridiculous. What should have been a pretty simple task became an extremely mundane and repetitive grind. And since progress didn't carry over between your characters, if you wanted all three sets, you had to do every set of tasks on every character. While it wasn't the most difficult challenge Destiny has ever presented, it was certainly one of the most repetitive ones on our list. For those of you who are newer to the game, Destiny has had a long history where Guardians could align themselves as members of Dead Orbit, New Monarchy, or the future War Cult factions. These each had some cool rewards back in Destiny 1, like faction-specific emblems, shaders, and ships, and eventually some exotic class items which were actually really cool. 
Shout out to my fellow Dead Orbit mains out there who spent thousands of hours grinding for the exclusive Revenant shader. But during Destiny 2's launch, factions felt pretty meaningless and Bungie wanted to change that. So they introduced some special events called Faction Rallies. Think of these kind of like Iron Banner but for PvE. These events, while offering some enticing rewards and a sense of camaraderie, included quite the grind. During Faction Rallies, you'd pledge your allegiance to one of the three factions. Each faction had an associated weapon with it, and if that faction won the event, you'd earn the ability to buy that weapon. If you were pledged to the winning faction during the event, your cost would be considerably lower. But the true grind came a bit later with the pursuit of Faction Exotic Catalyst during Season 3. Depending on which faction you would pledge to, you could earn the Catalyst for Sunshot, Graviton Lance, or Sweet Business. Earning a single Catalyst took an extreme amount of grinding, requiring you to reach rank 50 with your faction of choice. And if you were truly dedicated, you had the chance to earn all three Exotic Catalysts because the Faction Rally event happened three times during Season 3 before finally being retired in Forsaken. For many Guardians, Faction Rallies ruined that sense of inherent loyalty that we felt during Destiny 1 by pledging to one faction for many years in order to earn some extremely exclusive rewards. And instead, it became more of a chore to unlock certain items. By the end of Season 3, if you grinded out all three Catalysts, the sense of any loyalty that you had to a particular faction was more or less destroyed. Guardians are no strangers to grinding for loot in the three core playlists. It's really one of the pillars that comes along with playing Destiny. However, back in the early days of Destiny, we had some strike-specific loot. Weapons that could only be found in specific strikes by using skeleton keys to unlock the chest at the end of the strike. Imago Loop was basically a knockoff Fatebringer and was probably the most famous piece of this loot. Well, in Destiny 2, Bungie kind of brought back strike-specific loot, but with a different angle. Now it would come specifically from Nightfalls. But instead of relying on skeleton keys, you now relied on pure RNG. And man, that RNG really sucked. Chasing weapons like the original Silicon Neroma Sniper or DFA Hand Cannon felt next to impossible. It was common to run dozens of strikes with no success. While a lot of people will look back at this chase of fighting RNG with nostalgia, it wasn't so fun when you were on run number 52 with no luck. Many of these weapons have been added back to the loot pool with adept versions being accessible from Grandmaster Nightfall playlists, but I'll never forget the hours spent chasing some of these original Nightfall weapons. Up to this point, we've mostly been talking about PvE grinds. For the next bit though, we're going to go in the opposite direction and talk PvP. In Season 3, we got a revamped competitive PvP system with rankings and a mission from Shax. If you were one of the dedicated few to step into the ranked Crucible and had the skills necessary to hit the Fabled rank, which was not an easy task at this point mind you, you received the Redrick's Claymore, a weapon that had an exclusive perk Desperado. This thing absolutely shredded the Crucible for players who had it, but it was not easy to get. Grinding up to Fabled was just not in the cards for a great majority of the player base. In order to unlock the Regis Claymore, one of the requirements was to reach 2100 Glory. That might not sound too bad in the current climate, but in Season 3, if you had a 50% win rate, it would take you approximately 440 games of competitive PvP to reach this mark. This season also featured a loss streak mechanic where losses would progressively set you back further and further in rank, capping out at a streak of 5. Trust me when I tell you this, if you're a newer Destiny player, be glad that you haven't experienced the pain of watching an entire week of progress evaporate in one hour just because you're on a 5 loss streak. It was absolutely brutal. This weapon has remained one of the rarest weapons in Destiny history with less than 0.58% of the player base unlocking it. It was quite the grind indeed, but if you were truly dedicated, things got even crazier. If you wanted to get the exclusive ornament for Redrix called Glory and Grandeur, you had to unlock not only Redrix, but also grind all the way up to the Legend rank. This ornament is one of the rarest items in the entire game, and it was a brutally difficult thing to obtain. If you see someone in the Crucible still rocking Redrix with this ornament, you know that Guardian truly went through some painful PvP trenches to get it. A season later, Bungie wasn't done with the PvP grind yet, in fact this was only the start. The next set of Crucible Pinnacle weapons were introduced. Luna's Howl and Not Forgotten were not just powerful hand cannons, they were symbols of skill and dedication earned through blood, sweat, and tears in the Crucible. To earn Luna's Howl, Guardians had to prove themselves in the competitive playlist by reaching the same rank of Fabled from the Redrick season, albeit the grind was a bit easier this time around. But that wasn't the end. Not Forgotten awaited those who dared to push themselves even further by reaching the Legend rank in competitive. Both of these weapons were some of the strongest options in the entire sandbox and shifted the entire meta in PvP. With the original Magnificent Hell perk, you had one of the fastest time to kills in the game, and you could even 2-tap Guardians if you played your cards right. 
It opened up a massive debate in the community about the fairness of fighting against these pinnacle weapons in PvP in order to unlock them yourself. Personally, I do miss the days of having something really desirable to chase in competitive PvP. The end of pinnacle weapons was already coming into sight, but Bungie was not going to let the era of overpowered, exotic quality legendary weapons come to an end without a bang. And the mountaintop definitely produced a massive one. To put into perspective how crazy this gun really was when it first came out, let me ask you a question. What's the difference between a rocket launcher and a grenade launcher? Take a minute to think about this. Right, well the grenade launcher fires projectiles which fall with gravity, and rocket launchers fire projectiles which don't. Rockets usually fire in basically a straight line. At least most of them. So it was a massive surprise when Bungie gave us a special weapon which they advertised as a grenade launcher but actually launched projectiles which fly in straight lines and really really fast. That was the mountaintop. Similar to other pinnacle weapons before it, it required a seriously long quest to get it. It involved tons of grenade launcher kills in PvP and basically required you to become a fighting lion god if you wanted to get the mountaintop in any sort of reasonable time frame. Triple grenade launcher builds became meta for this quest, and it seems like some players never got the memo that they should stop. Anyway, Mountaintop dominated both the PvP and PvE sandboxes for a very long time, practically until Beyond Light where it became Sunset into Oblivion. Or I guess at least until Season 23. Back in the days when Iron Banner was light level enabled, Bungie had the idea to make it even a bit more painful than usual. They added a consumable which dropped your light level to give you a massive disadvantage. This meant that your weapons would deal significantly less damage than anyone else's while you also took increased damage from your opponents. The concept was pretty simple. By activating Iron Burden, Guardians would handicap themselves making it much more difficult to compete against their opponents. In return, they would earn additional Iron Banner tokens and a triumph for getting a certain number of kills with this handicap. That said, it was a lot of kills. The base triumph, Atlas Unbound, was 500 kills with the handicap, and the upgraded triumph, now you're just showing off, was 2500 kills. In Destiny, this was pretty difficult to manage. And those who would play with this handicap were rewarded with an emblem. Uh, time well spent, I guess. Shifting back to PvE, just because the grind is frustrating doesn't mean it can't be kinda fun. Situated in the mysterious confines of the European Dead Zone, Niobe Labs emerged as one of Destiny 2's most notorious challenges. The story of Niobe Labs begins with the Black Armory. Guardians spent the season hunting for sleek new weapons, unlocking forges, and helping Ada 1. After unlocking the first three forges, a discovery was made inside of the EDZ that there was a hidden puzzle. At its core, Niobe Labs was a complex puzzle filled with cryptic symbols, intricate mechanisms, and some deadly adversaries. We had to decipher the secrets hidden within the walls, unlocking doors, activating switches, and battling waves of enemies, all while under the pressure of a ticking clock. After many, many hours, teams finally cleared the Niobe Labs, which in theory should have been unlocking the Final Forge. However, before teams actually cleared the challenge, Bungie had decided to unlock the Final Forge anyway. A lot of the player base was pretty unhappy that they were being locked out of paid content until the community figured out what to do, so Bungie decided to put a timer on the Final Forge and unlock it regardless of whether the labs were actually completed or not. While it was still a grueling challenge for those who were committed to clearing out the most difficult content, the only tangible reward was a ghost shell. On the other hand, it was an absolutely frustrating grind to get through, especially since it required having all the black armory weapons on hand to clear the puzzle, but the removal of the secret reward at the end made it hurt even more. Before we get to our final pick, we have a couple of honorable mentions. The Truth to Power completed book was one of the items required for the Chronicler title. This wasn't exactly hard to do, but the challenge came from the fact that you could only complete each of the 11 books once every 3 weeks. This meant that if you wanted to complete everything, it would take you a whopping 33 weeks. Again, this was not exactly difficult mechanically, but it took a lot of time and required heaps of patience. Lastly, we have the Multiple Fronts Triumph. This was a triumph during the Season of Plunder, which required players to kill 250 champions during seasonal activities. This might not sound too bad, but each seasonal activity had a maximum spawn of 2 champions per run, and if players went too quickly, one or both of these champions wouldn't even spawn. After some player outcry, the number was reduced to 50, which is why we're placing it on this honorable mention list. This takes us to our final grind to end all grinds. While there are many, many seals to chase in Destiny, one of the most respected ones from the sheer insanity of the grind required is Reckoner. To get the Reckoner seal, players had to complete a very, very lengthy set of tasks in Gambit Prime, one of the most hated activities in Destiny history. This included, but was not limited to, Triumphant, Collector, Invader, Sentry, and Reaper, 
which required you to deposit over 1,000 modes, kill over 100 guardians while invading using various weapons, damage 40 invaders, and kill 1,000 enemies all while wearing the specific set of armor for the role that you were going for. Flawless Reckoning required players to complete the Reckoning activity at tier 3 without dying, and there was Get Wrecked, which required players to kill over 1,000 Shadow Thrall, get 250 Precision Blows, and kill 150 powerful enemies of which only a handful spawned. While it might not have required the dedication to material farming from the exotic sword quests in Destiny 1, or the PvP skills of early Destiny 2 competitive, this title was rated as one of the most frustrating ones to unlock for many veteran Destiny players. Up next, check out my video on 43 things that only Destiny veterans remember for another shot of Destiny nostalgia.